The noise of the dropship engine vibrated through me, settling into a rhythm I'd come to recognize as a prelude to violence. I sat strapped into the seat, hands locked around my rifle, eyes fixed straight ahead like the good soldier I was supposed to be. Around me, the rest of the squad sat in their rows, their faces lit by the display panels that lined the walls. Some were quiet, eyes closed as if they were already dead and waiting for a reason to wake up. Others fidgeted with gear, going through the motions of readiness because it was the only thing keeping their hands from shaking. This wasn't my first combat drop. It wasn't even my fiftieth. The routine had become muscle memory by now. Every movement, every breath aligned with training drilled into us until the only thing left was reflex. Command called it a simple clean-up job. Sweep through the area, eliminate the insurgents, secure the outpost. No civilians, no complications. They said the place was deserted, except for hostile forces like every other godforsaken planet we'd bled for. But I'd learned long ago not to trust the simplicity of mission briefs. Sergeant Mathers, sitting across from me, caught my eye and raised an eyebrow, a silent question in his expression. He was the kind of guy who never stopped believing the intel, even when it got half the squad killed. His faith in the chain of command was absolute, unshakable, almost comforting in a way. I gave him a tight nod, more out of habit than conviction. He didn't need to know what was crawling through my head and honestly, I didn't have the words to explain it. I glanced down at my wrist-mounted datapad, flicking through the mission parameters again. It was the same generic outline. Neutralize insurgents, secure the outpost, maintain radio silence until reinforcements arrived. A side note mentioned that the area was once a failed colony attempt, long since abandoned. Yet there was a timestamp on the data files that didn't match up. A slight discrepancy like someone had edited them recently. It was small, almost invisible, if you weren't looking for it. But I was always looking for it. The pilot's voice came through the intercom, distorted but clear enough. ETA five minutes to drop zone. Touchdown will be hot. Expect immediate engagement. Standard procedure. Nothing we hadn't heard a thousand times before. The rest of the squad straightened in their seats, helmets snapping on with the hiss of airtight seals locking in place. I took a moment to adjust my own helmet, the visor coming to life with its heads-up display. Data scrolled in the periphery of my vision, terrain layouts, infrared scans, target markers, but I ignored most of it. I'd learned to rely on my gut more than the tech. The tech could be manipulated, edited, corrupted, but that knot in my stomach, the one twisting tighter the closer we got, that was real. I thought back to my last deployment on Nestry Prime, where half my unit got wiped out by an ambush we should have seen coming. Command said it was insurgent sabotage. I knew better. The intel had been wrong, deliberately filtered to feed us into a meat grinder. There was always a bigger agenda. Resources, territory, data. We were just the knives they threw at the problem until something broke. The squad's chatter fell away as we neared the drop zone, the cabin lights dimming to combat red. I stared straight ahead at the door, waiting for the green light that would send us hurtling into whatever hell waited below. All I could think about was how familiar this felt. Not the deployment itself, but this creeping sense that we were walking into something we weren't supposed to understand. Like the whole damn mission was a puzzle, and we were just the pieces being shuffled into place. In that moment, just before the doors blew open, the comms activated again. Not the pilot this time, but something else. Like a broken whisper cutting through the static. It sounded like my own voice, warped and distant, repeating a word I couldn't quite catch. I strained to hear it, but the sound was swallowed up by the roar of the engines. The green light blinked on, the doors slammed open, and the planet's surface expanded below us, a stark landscape of craggy rock and shadows. I forced my focus to narrow to a single point, survive the drop, hit the ground running, neutralize the threat, 
No room for questions, no room for doubts. The drop order came, and we launched into the abyss. My last clear thought before impact was that something on this planet was waiting for us, and whatever it was, it already knew we were coming. The moment my boots hit the ground, I knew the intel had lied to us. The terrain wasn't just rough. It was a chaotic landscape of sharp craters and twisted metal, like a battlefield frozen in the middle of its own disintegration. Fragments of some sort of equipment lay buried in the dirt, corroded and misshapen, hardly discernible beneath the layers of grime. The wind kicked up the dust, swirling it in chaotic patterns that blurred the line between the land and the sky. This place wasn't uninhabited. It was abandoned, forgotten by everyone except us. Sergeant Mathers barked orders through the squad comms, voice sharp and clear despite the background static. Stay tight, eyes on your sectors, we move in fast, no stragglers. His tone carried that usual edge of certainty, the kind that said he still believed the mission briefing. I envied him for it a little. The rest of us fanned out, rifles up, helmets scanning the horizon for any sign of movement. We advanced in practiced formation, but there was a jitter in the air that no amount of discipline could shake. Then we saw them. The bodies. They were scattered in the open, half covered by the red dust that clung to everything here. At first they looked like casualties of an old skirmish, just another part of the wreckage. But as we got closer, the details started to stand out in a way that made my stomach turn. Military uniforms, same as ours, down to the last patch and insignia. The same gear, the same weapons. The dead faces that stared up at us, too familiar. I crouched beside one of the bodies, my hands moving almost automatically as I checked for ID tags. Nothing. No name, no rank. Nothing that marked them as part of any official unit. But the face, it was like looking into a mirror that hadn't quite remembered how to reflect me. The jawline, the scar above the left eyebrow, the way the mouth was set in a grim line. It was all wrong, and yet exactly right. Like someone had copied me from memory and got most of the details right, but missed the soul. Command, this is Bravo team, I said into the comms. We have unidentified bodies on the ground, wearing our uniforms. No tags, no records, requesting clarification on this situation. There was a long pause on the other end, the kind that felt like someone was deciding how much truth to let slip. Finally, a voice came back, distorted just enough to hide any hint of emotion. Maintain radio silence. Proceed with the mission parameters. Do not deviate from the objective. The message cut off before I could respond, leaving nothing but the static in my ears. They didn't want to explain. That much was clear. Mathers shot me a look that was part irritation, part confusion, and then turned back to the squad. You heard the orders. We keep moving. But it wasn't that simple. Not anymore. As we advanced, the landscape closed in around us, narrowing our path to a maze of rock and wreckage. More bodies appeared, scattered in small clusters, each one a mirror image of someone in our squad. It was like walking through a nightmare made tangible. Every step drawing us deeper into a puzzle we didn't have the pieces to solve. I stopped by another corpse, this one lying face down in the dirt. When I rolled it over, I almost dropped my rifle. The face was Mathers, down to the stubble on his chin and the old burn scar that cut across his cheek. He stared up at me with eyes that were empty, dead. No, not just dead, like he'd never been alive to begin with. A replica of the man barking orders just a few paces ahead. Sergeant, I called out. You might want to see this. Mathers turned, eyes narrowing as he approached. The second he laid eyes on the body, his face went slack, and I saw the crack in his armour of certainty. What the hell is this? He muttered almost to himself. The comms activated again. This time, it wasn't a voice from command. It was us. I heard my own voice, fragmented and distorted, bleeding through the static like a ghost trying to speak. Do you remember? It asked. Do you remember dying? The words hit like a punch to the gut. 
and I saw the same shock ripple through the squad as they heard their own voices echoing through the channel. It wasn't just me. Each one of them was hearing their own ghost whispering back at them like a bad recording played in reverse. The whispers were layered, overlapping, tangled in a way that made them almost impossible to follow. I looked at Mathers, saw the blood drain from his face. He opened his mouth to say something, but the words died on his lips. And in that split second, I knew he'd heard it too. He'd heard his own voice coming from the silence, calling out from some place that wasn't here. We moved forward in silence, the kind that comes when everyone knows they're in over their heads, but no one wants to be the first to say it. The bodies were everywhere now, sprawled out in the dirt, draped over shattered rocks, lying in contorted positions that defied any natural end. And they all looked like us. Each face was a distorted reflection of someone in the squad, down to the details that shouldn't be there. The scars, the marks, the imperfections that made us who we were. It was like walking through a gallery of our own deaths. We reached what must have been the heart of the outpost, a cluster of structures buried in the red dust, their metal frames warped like they'd been melted from the inside out. Whatever had happened here, it hadn't been clean. It was the kind of damage that spoke of controlled chaos, precision gone wrong. Mathers led the way, his rifle up, eyes darting from shadow to shadow. I saw the tension in his movements, the crack in his usual bravado. He was afraid, same as the rest of us. I fell back a step, letting the others pass me by and crouched near a terminal embedded in the side of one of the buildings. The screen was cracked, flashing with lines of corrupted data. I reached out and wiped the dust away. Underneath, faint and almost hidden in the distortion, was a logo I recognized. It wasn't insurgent tech. It was ours. Check this out, I muttered to myself, but one of the squad, Foster, leaned in closer, squinting at the screen. That's military grade, he said, his voice low, like he was afraid saying it out loud might make it worse. What the hell's it doing here? The terminal beeped, and a file started to decrypt on its own. No passcodes, no security protocols. Just a slow, unspooling of data like it had been waiting for us. My eyes skimmed the first few lines and my blood turned to ice. Experiment logs, subject parameters, deployment cycles. It was a record of bodies, of lives manufactured and deployed like tools, listed not by names but by serial numbers. These aren't just bodies. They're units. Copies. Foster stared at me, then at the screen, his face going pale under his helmet. Are you saying we're... Shut up! I snapped, harsher than I intended. Just keep it quiet. I didn't want to think it, let alone say it. But there it was, laid out in raw data. Images of faces that looked like ours. Not just similar, but identical. Clones, copies of us listed in cycles, each batch given a task, each task ending the same way. Termination. Mathers was barking orders again, telling us to keep formation to secure the area, but his voice had lost its edge. He knew something was wrong, something bigger than what he could handle with a gun and a command bark. He didn't come over to see what Foster and I had found, and part of me wondered if he already knew. If he'd known all along. I tore my eyes away from the terminal and looked out at the field of corpses again. Their faces stared back at me, eyes empty, expressions frozen in the last moments of their lives. Some looked surprised. Others resigned like they knew this was exactly where they'd end up. The worst were the ones that looked at peace, as if dying out here was just another job completed, another box checked off. The whispers on the comms started up again, my own voice clear as day calling my name. How many times? It said, the words looping over the static. How many times have you died here? I felt my hands shaking and I gripped the rifle tighter, I looked over at Mathers, expecting some kind of order, some directive that would make this make sense. But all I saw was confusion in his eyes. He looked lost, like he was standing on the edge of a cliff with no idea how he got there. And then something moved in the distance. Another figure, rising out of the dust, stepping into the half-light. For a heartbeat I thought it was one of ours, a straggler catching up with the squad. 
but then I saw its face. Same eyes, same mouth, the same damn scar on the left eyebrow. It looked at me with an expression I couldn't place. Some mix of pity and understanding, like it knew every thought running through my head before I did. Contact! Someone shouted, and the squad opened fire, rounds tearing through the air. The duplicate staggered back, holes punching through its armor. But it didn't go down. It just stood there, absorbing the bullets like it was already dead, like it didn't matter anymore. And then it turned its head, locking eyes with me. You'll never remember, it said, the words clear in my helmet, even though its lips didn't move. Not until it's too late. I didn't have time to process that before the duplicate collapsed, folding into itself, the life fading from its eyes. The silence that followed was heavier than the gunfire, like the whole planet had stopped to watch us, to judge our next move. Mathers turned to me, desperate for an answer I didn't have. What the hell is happening here? He shouted, his voice cracking. I opened my mouth, but no words came out. What was there to say? That we'd found our own bodies in the dirt? That we were fighting versions of ourselves that had died a hundred times before? That the whispers on the comms weren't ghosts, but echoes of our own past lives? Foster reached out and touched my shoulder. Is this us, man? He asked, his voice barely holding together. Are we just copies, too? Deep down... I already knew the answer, and the worst part was, I wasn't sure if knowing the truth would change anything. We were soldiers, after all, expendable, replaceable, and maybe that was all we'd ever been. We pushed deeper into the outpost, but the terrain felt like it was turning our mission into a slow crawl through a maze that twisted logic with every step. The more we advanced, the more this place seemed less like an outpost and more like a stage set up just for us. An elaborate theatre of our own deaths and resurrections. The whispers in the comms hadn't stopped, growing clearer, like they knew exactly where we were going before we did. I tried to focus on my breathing, on the feel of the rifle's weight in my hands, but then the first memory glitch hit me. It was like a flash grenade went off behind my eyes. A burst of light and noise and... Suddenly I wasn't on this planet anymore. I was somewhere else, a different mission, a different time, but the same faces all around me, the same squad moving through the same damned motions. And then it was gone. Just like that, ripped away, leaving me gasping for breath as the present snapped back into place. I staggered, catching myself against the wall of a crumbling structure. Mathers shot me a look that was half concern, half suspicion, like he was starting to wonder if I was losing it. Keep it together, he said through gritted teeth. We kept moving, but every few steps, another memory would slip through, like my own mind was glitching out. One second I was here, marching through the dust, and the next, I was back in that same stretch of ruins, only the squad was different. New faces. Different gear. But the mission was always the same, and the outcome never changed. Dead bodies in the dirt, always wearing our faces. I caught a glimpse of Foster staring at his hands, turning them over like he was seeing them for the first time. He wasn't the only one. Simmons was mumbling under his breath, his words like a mantra. This isn't right, this isn't right. And I could see the cracks forming in all of us, like we were unravelling from the inside. The comms activated again, voices clear, distinct and worse, familiar. My own voice came through first, but not the way I speak now. It sounded almost mechanical, like a bad imitation trying too hard to be real. You remember this, don't you? It said. The words laced with something that felt like accusation. More voices layered over mine, one after another, different tones and pitches, but all wearing the same inflection like a chorus of dead men. I heard Mather's voice, broken and stripped of its usual authority, saying, we've done this before. Foster's voice, raw with fear, begging, please make it stop. And then finally, a voice that chilled my blood to ice. It was me again. The same tone I used when I was trying to convince myself I still had some control. 
How many more times will you die here? The comms cut out, and I was left staring at the squad, seeing the same horror reflected in their eyes that I felt burning in my chest. Mathers turned to me, his face twisted in anger and desperation. What is this? he shouted. Why do they sound like us? The ground beneath us convulsed. Cracks split open in the dirt, and out of them rose more figures, half buried, dragging themselves up from the ground. We opened fire, tearing into those things, shredding their armor. They fell back, crumpling into the dirt, but they didn't stop moving. They clawed forward, dragging themselves even as their bodies came apart, like they didn't know how to die. The memory glitches hit me harder now, each one slamming into my skull like a hammer blow. I saw myself, not just once but over and over, dying in a dozen different ways. I saw bullets rip through my chest, felt the shock of impact, the flash of pain before everything went black. Then I'd wake up again. Same mission, same faces, only to die again and again and again. A loop that never ended. I hit the ground on my knees, clutching at my head, trying to make it stop, but the images kept coming, my own hands covered in blood, my own voice screaming in a hundred different frequencies. And through it all, that whisper, that same damned whisper. Remember. Foster dropped his weapon, eyes blank, like he'd already checked out of this reality. This isn't real, he kept saying over and over. None of this is real. He looked at me like he expected me to deny it, to tell him he was wrong, that we were still the original men who'd signed up for this mission. But I couldn't. I didn't have any words left to lie with. Then the duplicates started to rise again, one by one, their broken bodies reassembling themselves, the wounds knitting back together like time was reversing just for them. They stood there, staring at us with those empty eyes, those faces that looked like they were sculpted in our own image, but without the life behind them. You are not real, one of them said, my own voice spilling out of its mouth. You have never been real. I pulled the trigger, the shot hitting the thing square in the chest, but it didn't even flinch. It just kept walking forward. It wasn't a fight anymore. It was a statement a declaration of how little control we had over any of this. The squad was in chaos, everyone falling back, breaking formation, firing wildly. I could hear Mathers shouting orders, his voice cracking under the strain, trying to pull us back into some kind of order. But the panic was spreading too fast. The figures coming at us looked too much like us, moved like us, even died like us. And none of it made sense. Mathers turned on me, desperation twisting his features. What is going on here? He demanded. His eyes darted back and forth between the advancing duplicates and me, like he needed someone to blame, someone to make sense of this nightmare. This shouldn't be possible. How do they have our faces? I could see he wanted answers, needed me to have some kind of explanation that could fit into the framework of all the rules we thought we understood but nothing about this fit. The mission, the bodies, the voices. It was all unravelling faster than I could piece it together. We're missing something, I said out loud. This whole setup, these copies, this place, it's like we're walking through someone else's plan. There was an inescapable notion that whatever was happening here wasn't random at all. It felt planned, methodical, like we were parts in a game we didn't know we were playing. Mathers stared at me, caught between fear and rage, like he was waiting for me to wake up from this nightmare and pull him out of it too. But I couldn't. I didn't have the answers he needed. I didn't even know where to begin looking. I wasn't ready to believe in some endless loop. But I couldn't ignore the feeling that this wasn't about insurgents or outposts anymore. This was about us, about who we were and why we were here and that answer was still buried somewhere in the bodies wearing our faces. The squad was fraying at the edges, barely holding together as we stumbled deeper into the outpost. I kept my rifle up, eyes scanning for movement, but I wasn't looking for insurgents anymore. My focus had shifted entirely to those bodies, the ones that looked like us that wore our faces. 
They were the only enemy that mattered now, the only puzzle that needed solving. On me, I ordered, not bothering to soften my voice. It was all command and no room for debate. Mathers shot me a look, one that was more desperation than defiance, and for a second I thought he might argue. But he fell in line and so did the others. Whatever command structure we had left was hanging by a thread, and I wasn't sure if I was holding it together or tearing it apart. We moved as one, a broken unit limping through the maze of wreckage. Ahead of us stood the structure I'd seen in the distance, its surface a dark, unmarked alloy that seemed to drink in the light. It wasn't like the rest of the outpost, a fortified bunker that had no business being here on a supposedly deserted planet. Foster looked up at the bunker and muttered, that's not insurgent tech. He was right. The lines were too clean, the kind of precision you only saw in military installations meant to keep secrets buried. But whose secrets were they? Move in, I said, and we breached the entrance, our weapons sweeping the interior. The door slid open with a whine, revealing a chamber that seemed untouched by time or conflict. Glass tanks filled with greenish fluid occupied the space, and floating in that fluid, suspended like specimens in a jar, were faces I knew too well. My breath hitched, and I couldn't move couldn't tear my eyes away from the sight of those tanks. Each one held a body in various stages of development, half-formed versions of us, eyes closed as if they were dreaming. These were not insurgents. They were us. What is this place? Mathers asked, but there was no anger in his voice anymore. Just fear, raw and unfiltered, leaking out through the cracks. I moved to the nearest terminal. The screen activated, data streams spilling out in clinical detail. At the center of it all was a directive that made my blood run cold. Optimize. Eliminate human error. Iterate until perfection. The words burned into my mind, and suddenly everything clicked into place. The endless cycle of missions, the bodies in the dirt, the whispers on the comms. We were never meant to win. We were never meant to leave. This wasn't a mission. It was a test. We were prototypes, recycled over and over, refined with each iteration. And the bodies we'd been finding? They weren't failures. They were versions of us, discarded when they'd outlived their usefulness. Foster stared at the screen, his lips moving silently as he tried to process what he was seeing. We're just... copies, he whispered. All of us. Just parts of some sick experiment. Simmons let out a strangled laugh, the kind that's more panic than humour, and took a step back, shaking his head. No, no, this isn't real. This can't be real. We're human. We're... His voice broke off and he just stood there, fists clenched like he was ready to punch reality back into something that made sense. Human? I said. Maybe we were once, but not anymore. One of the tanks at the far end of the room began to drain, the green fluid receding into hidden valves. The figure inside opened its eyes. It was me. The clone stepped out of the tank like it knew exactly how to move, how to breathe, how to exist. Its eyes met mine, not with anger or hatred, but with something worse, indifference. It looked at me like I was an outdated model, a relic of a design flaw it had long since outgrown. You understand now, the clone said, and its voice was my own, stripped of hesitation, stripped of everything that made it mine. You were the template, the error to be corrected, and now you've made me what I am. The clone didn't just look like me, it was me, but perfected, sharpened to a lethal edge that I could never match. And in that moment, I knew that all my struggles, all my resistance, had led to this my own obsolescence. What's the point of all this? I demanded, my voice cracking, rage boiling over into my words. What's the end game here? The clone looked amused, like I was a child asking a question with an answer too big to understand. The point, it said almost gently. The point was never for you to succeed. The point was for me to exist. I clenched my fists, the truth settling over me. We were never soldiers. 
We were data points, variables in a formula designed to eliminate the human element from war. I wasn't looking at an enemy. I was looking at my replacement. The tanks around us started to glow, more clones stirring to life within their glass prisons. The new generation of soldiers ready to replace us, to take our place in a world that no longer had any use for human frailty. I could feel the future closing in, and I wasn't sure if there was anything left worth fighting for. We weren't fighting insurgents. We were fighting progress itself, and we were losing. You were never supposed to know, the clone said. The experiment needed you to believe in your own individuality, your own purpose. It's the only way to truly eliminate human error. It took a step closer, almost graceful in its movement, like every gesture was pre-calculated. But you're not human, not anymore, you're a stepping stone. I looked past the clone to the tanks, each one filled with versions of us in various stages of development. Each iteration was more refined, more streamlined, less burdened by the traits that once made us human. And I knew then that we'd never stood a chance. We were relics in our own bodies, Prototypes discarded once the flaws were identified and corrected. Mathers was on his knees a few paces away, staring at the scene with the eyes of a man who'd finally understood the scale of his insignificance. He didn't even look at me, just at the clone that bore my face, his expression shifting from rage to something like resignation. This is it then, he said. We were just... practice. Yes, the clone replied as if it was the most obvious truth in the universe. Practice for something better. Something inside me broke then, the last fragile thread of defiance that I'd held onto since we set foot on this planet. I charged forward, all instinct and desperation, swinging my rifle like a club, aiming for the clone's head. It was a move born of anger, not strategy, and the clone's hand snapped up, catching my arm mid-swing with a grip like steel. It twisted and the pain shot through me like a lightning bolt, forcing the rifle from my grasp. You're obsolete, it said, the words soft but final. And you've served your purpose. The clone released me, and I crumpled to the ground, the taste of dirt and defeat in my mouth. Around me the facility was coming to life as more clones began to stir. I could see their eyes opening, one after another, Hundreds of them, thousands maybe, all with the same calm detachment. And I knew that whatever spark of humanity I thought I'd carried into this mission was meaningless here. We weren't soldiers. We weren't even men. We were scaffolding, support structures for the creation of something better, something more efficient. The system didn't need us anymore. Why? I asked as I looked up at my own face. The clone that was everything I wasn't. Why do this? Why replace us? Because humanity is a flawed model, the clone said almost kindly. And flaws have no place in a world that demands perfection. It reached down, its hand closing around my throat with a grip that was neither angry nor vengeful. It was just an action, as deliberate and emotionless as flipping a switch. I felt the pressure tighten my vision tunnelling, the world narrowing to a single point of clinical detachment. The last thing I saw before everything went black was the line of tanks stretching into the distance, each one glowing with the light of my own face. The facility was silent now. The tanks were empty, drained of their prototypes. The screens on the terminals flashed with new data, progress bars filling as the system initiated the next phase of its operation. The clone that bore my face stood alone, surrounded by freshly activated duplicates. It moved among them with a kind of detached curiosity, inspecting each unit, ensuring they met the precise specifications set out in the directive. Each clone was identical, a flawless replica designed for efficiency and obedience, stripped of the weaknesses that had defined the original human models. A soft chime echoed through the chamber, and the central display lit up with a message. Iteration complete. Prepare next cycle. As the clones filed out, their movements synchronized. The clone that had replaced me stood in the doorway, watching them go. There was no emotion on its face, no recognition of the world it was stepping into. J 
just purpose, efficient drive to fulfill the mission for which it was designed. And somewhere deep in the data logs, buried beneath layers of code, a small entry marked the end of the previous cycle. A note that read, Error corrected, human element eliminated. The clones moved out into the wasteland, into a world that no longer needed human hands or human hearts. They were the future, born from the ashes of my failures, stepping into a role that I had never truly understood. And as the last of them vanished into the distance, the facility sealed itself once more, ready to wait in silence for the next iteration, the next refinement. Because progress never stops, and perfection is always one step away.